Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Niche Pursuits podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Hawes from nichepursuits.com. And before we jump into today's episode, I wanted to tell you a little bit about Ezoic. Ezoic is an ad platform that I have been using on my niche site project for site, and I've been very happy with it. Ezoic is a Google award-winning technology that everyone from niche website owners to major brands use to grow and monetize their websites. Ezoic is also a Google certified publishing partner. The platform leverages artificial intelligence to learn from website visitors with the goal of providing more personalized experiences that will improve on-page experiences, which is session length, while also optimizing revenue and monetization on a per visitor basis. The Ezoic platform features everything from intelligent website analytics to advanced automated visitor segmentation tools that allow publishers to improve visitor experiences and increase overall website revenue. Overall, there really are some big benefits to using Ezoic. It's more than just an ad platform, but it truly is a platform that allows publishers to implement sophisticated ad operations and monetization practices on their websites using advanced artificial intelligence. This allows publishers to manage as much or as little as they want. You simply drag and drop ad placeholders and Ezoic will help automatically test thousands of ad partners, ad locations, ad types, and control ad density. This means Ezoic optimizes revenue and engagement for each unique visitor, maximizing the revenue publishers earn. If you want to go and check out Ezoic, you can go to nichepursuits.com slash ezoic. Again, that's nichepursuits.com slash ezoic. Today, I'm excited to introduce you to Tommy Griffith from clickminded.com. Tommy is someone that has been involved with SEO for a long time at a couple of really large companies. He started as an SEO manager for PayPal and then moved over to Airbnb as an S. EO manager there as well. Pretty cool stuff. What you might find interesting is that SEO at a large company like Airbnb is not all about keyword research and backlinks. Larger sites deal with more design and site architecture type issues, and working there was no easy task. However, as you'll hear, Tommy started teaching an SEO course on the side, and that has now become a full-time business for him. He's had a ton of ups and downs along the way that he talks about but he's been able to build a great business. I hope you'll listen in to Tommy's full story and some of the SEO tips that he has to share. If you want to check out the full SEO course that Tommy has, you can go to nichepursuits.com slash clickminded. That's nichepursuits.com slash clickminded. Overall, I hope you enjoy the interview. Hey, Tommy, welcome to the Niche Pursuits Podcast. Spencer, thanks for having me, man. I really appreciate it. Yeah, it's uh, great to have you on. I'm not sure originally how you crossed paths with Niche Pursuits, and honestly, I'm not sure originally how I crossed paths with ClickMinded, but I've sort of known (laughs) about you. I don't know originally where it was, but it's great to finally connect and have you on the podcast and uh, discuss your business. Yeah, for sure. I've listened to a bunch of different random episodes over the years, but my first interaction with you was probably Longtail Pro. Mm -hmm. And so was using that. uh, We actually used it. I don't I I probably should have emailed you when you were doing this. But when I was um, managing SEO at PayPal, we were using your tool. So uh, (laughs) well, look at that. (laughs) Wow, go. that's awesome, man. That's very cool. I know it's been a little while since you've been at PayPal, but uh, I appreciate that. That's very cool. Yeah, for sure. I had no idea who you were. I just <laughs> was using your tool. <laughs> that's, that's interesting. So this wasn't one of my questions, but as somebody doing internal SEO or just doing SEO for a large company like PayPal or Airbnb, like we're going to talk about, it sounds like maybe you didn't have special tools that were created by PayPal or Airbnb. You were just using third-party tools like Longtail Pro. For sure, we were. That probably changed towards the end of my four years at Airbnb. We had, I wouldn't say we were creating our own internal tools, but we definitely had our own internal um 
processes and uh, internal testing and an experiment framework once we were investing mm-hmm. more in SEO and, and and my team grew. But yeah, I mean, I, six years, managed SEO, PayPal and Airbnb, and the majority of the time was using regular third-party tools that everyone everyone would use from yeah. rank, tra- rank tracking to keyword research to, you know, anything you would imagine, just the standard uh, standard stuff that, that you would do creating a, a landing page for a $10 ebook. We were right. also using it at massive, massive <laughs> websites. Yeah. Very interesting. So how did you get started in SEO? Yeah. So my entry into this whole game was probably like many others with the four hour work week. I'm sure you're very familiar with mm-hmm. Tim Ferriss book. Yeah. So a lot of people get in that way. And I, I wrote a very dorky ebook uh, back in 2008. I studied finance. The banks crashed, had no idea what to do. And like a lot of people, yeah, got into that way. Okay, I wrote my ebook. How do I get it to the top of Google? Right. Yep. And so that was sort of my first first idea. I ended up trying to start a business with a friend of mine that was a horrible idea. We we borrowed money from family and friends, worked on it for a year. I was really underqualified to be doing this. And that ended up not working. Moved around a lot, moved to an agency, tried a million different things. And eventually it was just kind of right place, right time at PayPal. I taught myself SEO at the time and ended up managing SEO there um, when I was about 24. So pretty young. Yeah. And it sort of took off from there. So let's dive into that. So how do you end up sort of managing SEO at PayPal? I mean, it doesn't sound like from your previous comment there that that's not necessarily what you originally came on for, but maybe grew into that. Is that right? Uh, No, I actually did come on for that. But it's really interesting. I've actually never really spoken about this or thought about this much since, but it's really funny how big companies hire, right? And especially with PayPal, it was pretty, I don't want to dog them too much, but it's a pretty (laughs) slow, lethargic company that everyone's annoyed with. And Mm -hmm. I think it works a lot more like a bank than anything else. And it was just one of these things where, you know, the right department at the right time acquired budget to get someone to hire someone to solve a problem, which was like their particular part of that business wasn't wasn't ranking well in certain countries. I was okay. actually hired originally to manage SEO for emerging markets, so kind of non-English markets. But then someone realized, wait, no one's managing SEO anywhere for anything. And I just ended up taking, <laughs> taking all of it. So. <laughs> is that right? Wow. Um, yeah. So that is pretty impressive at a young age to be managing SEO for you know such a large company. We don't have to talk too much about your time there, but then you then went on to Airbnb to also manage their SEO, correct? Yeah. Yeah. So moved over to Airbnb after two years and that was pretty wild. I was sort of joined in 2013 and it was just a crazy time to to join, right? Like the first week I was at Airbnb, we were subpoenaed by the state of New York for data. And the last week I was there, I was working on a Super Bowl ad and Beyonce was staying in an Airbnb, right? Like wow. that kind of thing. So it's just like pretty wild. The business doubled every year I was there for four years straight. And it was just a kind of a crazy, crazy time to be there. Yeah, that's a pretty exciting time to have be a part of such a high growth company. Not a lot of people will be able to experience that. So doing SEO there, I, what exactly does it mean to be an SEO manager? I mean, were you overseeing all the SEO of the company, specific areas? How did that work? Yeah, it fluctuated a little bit. I joined sort of reporting to someone and then it was just me for a while. And then by the time I left, uh, I had a team of, t- of 12, t- 10 or 12, some people part time uh, or part part of their work was on it. But um, yeah, the way the way we manage search engine optimization to Airbnb is very, um, very different than uh, what most of the audience here would be thinking about. Enterprise SEO mm-hmm. is um, a different animal in and of itself. And I would actually argue that enterprise SEO in general is extremely boring, <laughs> right? Like, sure. um, I think the funniest example for enterprise SEO is the fact that Google has an SEO team. <laughs> and that that tells you a lot. What that means is enterprise SEO is having meetings and putting together PowerPoints where you explain to people why they shouldn't no index things, <laughs> right? Or like <laughs> it's like it's a lot of like executive, you know, managing up and executive expectations and like total addressable market sizing for stuff. And I mean, the fact that Google has people that have to evangelize SEO shows you it's just kind of big company navigation stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, that was not at all what it was in the early days with with Airbnb we did we were much more agile than that but but PayPal was probably a lot more of that 
Um, the, the, the thing that was interesting with Airbnb was it's a, and this is a little bit different based on the type of business you are, whether you're a content play or a web application, right? So we were managing traffic that's coming into our web application, not right. creating content for it. And the way to think about this, a really good model for this is Pinterest. We actually worked, we met with the Pinterest team a couple of times as friends with their SEO manager and Airbnb and Pinterest were actually pretty close. We were on the same block in San Francisco. Uh, the, the recruiters were poaching each, the employees from both companies all the time. People were like dating each other at each company, right? <laughs> like there's a lot of crossover. So we were, we were friends with them and they helped us build an experiment framework to manage a lot of our experiments there. They actually published exactly how to do it on their engineering blog. And then we did one similar and published one on our data science blog, I think a year or two later. But um, it's a lot more of the total conceivable number of pages we were optimizing for at PayPal was like 50 to 100. And the total conceivable number of pages at Airbnb was, was, was probably more than 5 million or 10 million. Wow. Um, because of every possible variation, right? So, okay, vacation rentals in Miami, that's an easy one, right? But then you get all these variations, family friendly villa in San mm -hmm. Diego, right? Pet friendly right. condo in Detroit. But then you have even crazier ones, right? Like, you know, family friendly boutique hotel in Paris written in Hungarian for someone searching from the Czech Republic, right? And uh, so yes. the total number of permutations there was really high. And, you know, we had 55 top level domains, 20 different languages supported. So there's a, there's a lot there. Um, but it was more about managing the engineering behind the web application and running experiments rather than like, let's create a blog post for like the seven, seven best family friendly ideas ideas for San Diego, right? So it's very, very different. Right. It is very different. Um, just a whole different animal. Um, so were there any particular SEO strategies that you used at Airbnb that worked really well? For the majority, just to be frank, Spencer, the majority of my time at Airbnb was me just getting my ass kicked. <laughs> it was like, <laughs> it was a really humbling and interesting experience because this was, uh, this was, you know, we did, we grew SEO traffic a lot. The team grew a lot. We had a big impact on the company, but Airbnb was in a fascinating position because the company is run by designers. And mm -hmm. I think, I think it's easy to argue that a lot of Airbnb's success was because they were so particular about their design. The majority of my time was actually trying to make a lot of our pages more search engine friendly without ruining the design. Gotcha. Right. And mm -hmm. so that's was big on Airbnb, really high quality photography with really heavy page load kind of pages, trying to remove as much text as possible. That was like the dream for the designers. And it mostly kept me up at night and screaming into my pillow. Right. <laughs> right? It was a lot of managing expectations. And this would happen all the time. We would look at a page, we'd say, this is the change we want to make. Here's the impact we think it'll have. Here's the no X number of nights we think it'll drive. Here's the impact on the business. And, you know, a higher level executive or sometimes even the co-founder would look and be like, nope. We can't do that. And mm -hmm. they, it would be, they would say it's worth, it's not worth the trade off. Um, and when I was young and of course, you know, to every SEO, what, what's that saying? Every, every problem looks like a nail when you're a hammer or something like that. Right, like, right, right. Yeah. And I always thought the solution was SEO. And, you know, looking back, I think people much wiser than me would often shut me down correctly, right? They would say that's not, that hurts the user experience. We're not going to implement that change. And in, in, in some of the cases, I think they were right. So it was a interesting time for sure. Yeah. So it was very much a corporate environment. It's not like running your own portfolio of sites. You can't just say, well, I'm going to make this change and do it. Like you said, there's committees, there's people that are higher up, your managers that are going to push back and tell you no. Right. So a whole different ball game there. A lot of probably very technical SEO type issues that come up that, yeah, maybe if I've just got a WordPress blog with content on it, I don't even have to worry about or think about. Exactly. Yep. A lot of internationalization, a lot of translation issues. It wasn't nearly as, as slow moving as I'm portraying it, right? Like it was still to contrast it at PayPal. We pushed out a code change once every two weeks. Like you literally needed to, it was two weeks to push out a change. Mm -hmm. And at Airbnb, the, the team's pushing up usually 15 to 20 times per day. Okay. So mm -hmm. there was still, it's still, still very, very, on. still very nimble company. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Very cool. So I now want to talk a little bit about Click minded. Where did the idea come from? Why in the world did you start it when you've already got a great job? 
Yeah. So ClickMinded is a digital marketing training platform for entrepreneurs and, and marketers. It started as a side project at PayPal. I started teaching SEO on the weekends. I was actually trying to get out of debt from my first business idea. I <laughs> borrowed a bunch of money from family and friends and and was trying to sort of hustle up enough cash to pay down all my debt. Right. And so I started teaching search engine optimization to startups on the weekends in San Francisco. I'd rent out a co-working space and just kind of physically in person, one-on-one teaching a class. It was sort of the right place, right time with this online learning renaissance that we're in right now. Are you familiar with Udemy? I am. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I started on Udemy and it was just kind of like right place, right time with them. I created my first SEO course and continued to work on it while while doing this enterprise SEO thing. We started using the the online course to train up people at PayPal. And then when I switched over to Airbnb, kept improving the course and was using it to train up people at Airbnb. And after maybe three years, it ended up started to bring in more revenue than my salary. Which is always a good thing, I guess, right? Yeah, yeah. It was a lot of fun. I kept working on it. And then uh, about two years ago, I left Airbnb to go full time on it. And the last two years have been traveling, working on the business, had a ton of high highs, a ton of low lows, nearly drove it into the ground last year. And and it Mm. sort sort of recovered and doing really well now. So it's been exciting. A lot of ups and downs along the way, which I think I'll like to dive into a little bit here. But Before we do, can you give people a sense of the type of success that you're having with your business now and whatever you're comfortable sharing, whether that's revenue numbers or number of users or traffic or, you know, just to give people an idea of, you know, just uh, how far you've come since you started. Yeah, sure. Um, I actually I have a blog post where I sort of wrote about the last two years and have it right in front of me here. Yeah. So the very first year and the other sort of crazy part about this is that this has been a side project. that's eight years old. Yeah. <laughs> and, and part of what I write in my blog post is, you know, I feel like I've been successful, but then I look at the following, you know, the following companies were started after ClickMinded, Lyft, $24 billion, Snapchat, $15 billion, Instacart, $7 billion, SoFi, $4 billion, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's all relative. But yeah, I started yep. ClickMinded in 2012. I have the numbers right here. It was only in-person training, and I made eleven thousand dollars that year. Uh, probably working way, way more than I should have. Um, and uh, yeah, forty-nine thousand dollars in 2013, one hundred seventeen thousand dollars in 2014. So that was the year where I uh, um, started making more than my salary. One hundred thirty-seven thousand in 2015, one hundred sixty thousand in 2016, three hundred twelve thousand in 2017, and then last year, three hundred seventy-eight thousand. Uh, this year, we're on track to do about four hundred ninety thousand. Awesome, so, man! Congrats. That's a nice little business. Yeah, it's been like I said before. It's pretty happy with it now, but you could also argue that. For eight years, <laughs> that's <laughs> very unsuccessful, right? It kind of depends on what your perspective is. Right. Absolutely. I think most people listening would would be happy to have a business the size that you have now, but would they be willing to try and fail and grow slowly for eight years, right? That's That's the work that sometimes is required for these things that I think a lot of people just wouldn't be willing to put in, obviously, that amount of time and effort to make something grow to that uh, size. You mentioned in your comment that sort of last year or a year ago or something that uh, you almost drove the business into the ground. I'd I'd like to hear about what are some of the challenges that you've had recently or, you know, when you were thinking of, you know, when you made that comment, what's something that's gone wrong with the business that made you consider either shutting it down or struggle with? Yeah, for sure. So uh, I think the big, the the one thing I did right was... uh, when I sort of took my time to to leave, and I don't I don't want to conflate that with waiting to launch. A friend of mine, Dan Andrews, he runs a entrepreneur group. I don't know if you know Dan. I do uh, know Dan. You do yeah. know Dan. Mm-hmm. Cool. Yeah. So he sort of coined this term recently called exit velocity, and I really like this idea. He, you know, he, the way he describes it, I actually have it right here. He said. Exit velocity is the amount of professional and entrepreneurial momentum you have when quitting your job and starting a new venture. Momentum can come from a variety of sources, investment, capital experience, anchor clients, industry knowledge and connections, a.k.a. unfair advantage. And so the way I like to I had a lot of exit velocity when I left 
you know, I was working at big companies managing SEO. I was dog fooding the product at those companies. I was building the product up to be higher than my salary. So by the time I left, I sort of had a running start. And the way I like to think about this is like a cannon. Your side project is like a cannon and you're slowly pointing it up in the air, right? Mm -hmm. And if you have no exit velocity, you're, you're just pointing it horizontally straight. But the more exit velocity you have, you're kind of shooting out of a cannon. And so I had a lot of exit velocity with the SEO course, but then we went on to go create a bunch of new courses and I had less exit velocity with them and started to have a serious struggle. Right. And I, I was really into this sort of Tim Ferriss four hour work week nomad thing. And I was getting really excited planning my exit of San Francisco. And, you know, I had this big dream to go to Bali and move to Bali and like work on my business and meet all these cool people. Mm -hmm. And when I eventually got there, I, I realized that like I had really set my expectations way too high. You know, I had been planning my escape for too long and I was really getting sort of sick of San Francisco. And like I was envisioning this life that was just completely unattainable, you know, <laughs> like yeah. co coconuts on the beach and the business is going to grow so much. and I'm going to meet so many cool people. And like, you know, the first week I was in Bali, I got robbed my first day. Uh, I got food poisoning and was throwing up everywhere. You know, I'd refilmed the course with a friend of mine and invested all this time in it and realized like all the filming we had done, spent uh, more than $10,000 on everything. And all the filming we had done was nearly ruined because it was raining and the audio was bad. Oh, and so it was no. just like, I'm sitting there in Bali and looking up at the sky, I'd just been robbed. I was throwing up. I had like this overpriced hard drive full of footage on it. <laughs> and I'm just thinking back, like Airbnb was, was like an all inclusive resort, right? I mean, you know, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, the stock options, the beanbag chairs and the MacBooks. And I'm sitting there like throwing up on an Island in the South Pacific. Like, what am I doing? You know? Um, oh, wow. Yeah. And so it was very tough times getting started for sure. Yeah, so what you're saying is you worked more than four hours a week as well. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it's um, wow that uh, that would be tough, you know, kind of when you're down. I mean, how do you, how do you pick yourself up from something like that? Yeah, so I ended up, and this is pretty controversial. A lot of friends of mine said this was a really dumb move, but I, I wrote about it in this post and was was pretty open about it. I brought on a co-founder. Um, a guy I'd been working with for a while, I brought on the co-founder very late into the business, about the fourth year into the business. And it was mostly because of my own incompetency or my own inadequacy, right? I, uh, my Eduardo, my now co-founder, we had worked together. He was kind of an apprentice for a while. And he was sort of um, more like a CTO-ish type role, helping fix a lot of the automation we had, had a lot, had actually a much stronger vision for where we could take it which I think is controversial. I know a lot of entrepreneurs are supposed to be the ones driving the bus, right? Mm -hmm. But the reality is for our customer avatars, Eduardo was a much closer fit for sort of who we thought we should target. And I ended up bringing him on board and that's when everything changed. Like I don't really think I could have gotten the business past that $150,000 a year plateau without bringing on someone else and that second set of eyes. Right. And I don't, act, and I don't mean second set of eyes, like, you know, hire someone smart and have them look at everything for four hours. Right. Like the McKinsey or the Harvard graduate guy. I, I mean, yeah. I mean someone in the trenches with you, they give up their job and they work on the same problem for a year, like that kind of second set of eyes. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. And I could see how that would be very helpful. It is also very risky, like your friend said, you know, kind of giving up a portion of your business, right, to a partner. That's not easy to do. But at the end of the day, if that helps grow the business and so both of you have a larger, you know, pie after you working together, then it's worth it, right? Then it's worth it, right, exactly. So to kind of talk about specifically what is in your product, in your um, your training there at ClickMinded, what uh, type of users are you targeting? Is it only sort of enterprise SEO people or agencies? And what type of material is in your content in your uh, training course there? Yeah, yeah. So we have, we have seven different courses, um, SEO, 
paid advertising, content marketing, email marketing, social media marketing, Google Analytics, and sales funnels. And our model is we try and find world-class people that do this every day to, to teach it, right? So the former head of social media from Airbnb teaches the social media course. The former content strategist from Lyft teaches the content course. And we sort of... Uh, kind of beginner to intermediate level, focusing on entrepreneurs, marketers, and consultants and agencies. And our, our, we try and do like technical training that's that's fun. We sort of try and make it lighthearted and nerdy is our is our angle. Mm-hmm. And we're really we're really proud of the product. One other thing we do is this uh, it's, in, it's called the SOP library. We focus on really specific actionable digital marketing SOPs, so checklists and cheat sheets to uh, to um, actually implement a lot of the stuff on your own. Yeah, no, very good. So a lot of um, yeah, just actionable steps that people can follow along to learn SEO. Um, talking specifically now about the business and how you've grown it. I know you mentioned that originally you were teaching in person, I think you said in the San Francisco Bay area, Mm -hmm. uh, and then you moved online to Udemy and, and had a course there. Now you've shifted of course to, uh, your own website, you're, you're off, uh, anybody else's platform. Maybe you can just talk about the strategies you've implemented to kind of grow it from in person to now all online and what's working well now to continue to grow your business. Yeah, sure. Um, so we, you know, obviously we implement everything that we teach in the course. Um, we are, yeah, we're all on an online platform called teachable familiar with, I'm sure Mm -hmm. you're probably familiar with teachable. Yep. And, uh, our model is we have a lot of top of funnel organic traffic. So the vast majority of everything we do is, is free for everyone. And, um, we have a ton of value there, mostly through SEO and YouTube is all where all of our traffic's coming from. Okay. We have lead, lead magnets and downloadables and cheat sheets to move everyone into the middle funnel. So uh, we we usually have a, a, hey, here's how to do X thing. But here, if you want the resource to do it and put your own logo on it and whatever, hit, click here to grab it. Right. And we grab everyone's email that way. And so the vast majority of our business has really shifted towards building our email list and doing a lot of our nurturing um, through our automations. We're on drip and we have a really comprehensive, uh, automation going there. We followed a lot of, uh, Brendan Dunn's drip mastery course, which is very helpful. Okay. Um, the basic idea there is we are using, we have our different types of intent, right? So we have people interested in SEO, people interested in social media, people interested in email marketing. We create a ton of content for them and we grab their email address whenever it's appropriate. And then we have a really comprehensive funnel behind each, each one of those. So, um, going back to top of funnel, you mentioned, you know, of course your own content on your blog, uh, you're getting some traffic there, but you're also getting traffic from YouTube. Um, how well does YouTube do for you right now? YouTube has been, we really have not figured out YouTube yet. We, we have, um, what we found is, you know, when we went out to target YouTube specifically from a keyword perspective, we did really well, you know, so we're ranking usually in the top three for any keyword we pursued. But the key, and, and we're, our click-through rate from YouTube over to our site is actually higher than normal. YouTube sort of designed to keep people in their ecosystem and they don't really want to pull people out. Right. And and that's not how our business works. We want to pull people out. We want to grow our email list. Right. Um, I, I found the people who are doing the best at YouTube, they're very comfortable leaving people in the ecosystem. So it's watch another video, subscribe, stay on YouTube, stay on YouTube, stay on YouTube. That's what YouTube wants as well. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, we, the content we designed, we'll, we'll end up doing another round of it, but the content we designed for YouTube was extremely specific and really wasn't catered towards the suggested video, um, piece of the algorithm. Right. So I found that the people doing the best on YouTube are people who get their videos that are frequently, um, picked up as, as suggested video right. from other videos. We went the route of rank number one on YouTube or rank in the, um, in the snippets on Google that render YouTube videos. Mm-hmm. And while we did that and we did that well, it, uh, the sort of total addressable market for that, for those keywords wasn't nearly as high enough as, as if we had made a really high level, like, um, you know, what is SEO or SEO 2019 kind of content that's like 50 minutes long, really high production value. And is the suggested v- next video on, on everything you see, you know what I mean? Right. Yeah. You know, I see a lot of people 
getting on YouTube and, and doing videos. And it's it's kind of a hard market in a way, the SEO market, because even the videos that do really well, it's like only a few thousand views sometimes. You know, I see certain channels that they're producing content on a very regular basis and a lot of their videos aren't getting that many views. Um, so it's it's kind of a tough market, right? There's it's, Nothing's going to go huge and viral. Yeah, I would, you know, there are a couple of people that are, doing okay in it but the way we went about it so we also we also got really good at our processes and our operations and eduardo is really good at this stuff as well but like when we went out to create youtube videos we did it all in like a week and a half right so it wasn't like you know part of something we do every week we sat down we figured out the keywords we wanted to go for we created everything all at once we transcribed it all we turned them all into blog posts we turned them all into emails we we reused everything really really well it's really very efficient and then you know we use those emails every day we use those blog posts every day but the youtube component of that actually generated less traffic for us than than we were hoping for and i agree with you um i think there are a lot of people out there on YouTube that are creating a lot of content that probably won't be seen by very many people. So they should um, they they should keep that in mind because um, I, I I do think a lot of people are spinning their wheels yep. on YouTube in certain verticals. Right. Exactly. So what other types of content marketing uh, or other strategies have you used to grow ClickMinded? So uh, we're having a ton of success with uh, mini courses and webinars. Okay. Uh, um, so we, you know, all of our courses are four to six hours long, and we found this one particular topic, ta- to- uh, tactic. Again, it's from um, Brandon Dunn that worked really well, which is, uh, you know, we have a ton, ton of top of funnel content that's ranking. We're pulling those users into the site and then we give them access to a mini course. It's basically a 30 minute preview of, of whatever the primary course is. Mm-hmm. But what we do is, is we say this, we say, okay, Hey, you're now enrolled in the mini course. You're going to re, uh, lose access within seven days. So we actually revoke access and we say, okay, here's this mini course. We keep them up to date. We, we have templates and cheat sheets in it that you can access at any time. You have seven days to complete this. It's 30 minutes long. If you complete it, you'll, get, you'll retain lifetime access. You'll get all the updates. You can always grab the cheat sheets. We keep the cheat sheets updated. If you don't complete it within seven days, we revoke access and you can't ever get hmm. it again. Um, this ends up being, it's, it's, it's brutal to be so care and stick with users sometimes, but it really works. And, uh, users end up completing it. And then it's absolutely no surprise at all that when we send them a pitch later, if they've completed 30 minutes of the course, they're significantly more likely to convert. So we've had a lot of success with that. Yeah, that's, that's a really interesting, uh, tactic that makes a lot of sense. If you get people engaged with your content, if they go through the entire course, uh, they're more likely to both, well, hopefully want more because uh, they liked, um, you know, the the content that you're putting out. But they kind of built a relationship with you as well because they spent time with you. And as we know, customers are more likely to buy the more touch you know points we've had with them. So it sort of adds that additional, you know, touch point there over a week and exactly. they're more li- likely to buy, right? Yeah, exactly. And I'm sure I don't need to tell you this with your podcast, right? You have your voice in your users' ears all the time, right? It's the same with us. When we get more more of our video in front of people's eyes and ears, they, they trust us a lot more. Um, they're more confident about the product. They know what they're getting and uh, and they're much happier. Refund rates are lower as well. So every um, every everyone's happy. We're, we're seeing a yeah. lot of success with it. Now, you also mentioned webinars. Uh, what type of webinars are you doing? Just Are you doing webinars to your own list or are you partnering up with other people to kind of host webinars for their list? Yeah, it's a good question. We're actually doing both. Okay. Um, we, we started with, and we've actually basically become a webinar company recently. <laughs> like <laughs> we, we, are, we are really doing this and it's, it's having a lot of success. We follow the, um, I, I just love, it's not related at all, but Ramit, Ramit Sethi's whole model around, uh, you know, 98% of everything I create is free. I, I, and then, you know, my paid products for people who want the results faster. That's yeah. kind of the way we do it, right? Okay. So 
the vast majority of the stuff we work on is free. We sort of go absolutely insane with our webinars and they're just it was super valuable. We give away a ton of cheat sheets, checklists, you know, 20 page SOPs on exactly how to do it. We tell people they can remove our logo and put their own logo on it and take credit for it and all this stuff. And when they end, people are just usually they say, if this is what's free, the paid product must be incredible. I'm in. Yeah. Right. But that but the basic model we do with webinars is um, probably be pretty standard of, of anything you'd see out there. I really liked how Teachable does their webinars and virtual summits. Um, Maria Cause or um, Russell Brunson, perfect webinar formula. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the basic idea is you know, value, value, value for the first 95% of the webinar, a bunch of free downloadables. And then at the end, it's like, okay, well, uh, an offer to enroll at a, at a big discount. Mm-hmm. Um, we then do a replay email afterwards, and that's sort of the end of the funnel there. So we we provide the user with a bunch of different content for a couple of days or weeks beforehand, and then we give them, a, a whenever the next webinar is, we give them that offer, and then um, we try and get them to enroll at a discount. So how many live webinars a week or a month would you say you're doing right now? Yeah, we're doing, um, it really depends on the month. We've actually switched more recently to do uh, a lot of partner webinars. So it kind of depends, but the partnership webinars have been, um, hit or miss. And it's really, it's, it's, we've actually had a lot of success with partners who do webinars all the time. And we've had a tougher time with partners who they're interested in doing something, but it's their first webinar. Right. Running running webinars is actually very operationally expensive. It doesn't sound like it should be. Um, it's like just open your MacBook and talk into the microphone, right? But <laughs> uh, but it ends up being a whole production, right? It yep. ends up being a lot of work. Do you are you doing many webinars or attending many webinars? Is this part I, of your business at all? I, I have done several webinars. I'm not doing a lot right now, but over the years, definitely, either for Longtail Pro or other products that I've had, I've, I've done a lot of webinars. Yeah. And we, you know, prior to last year, I really hadn't done many of them. And I I didn't understand why they worked. I almost didn't even believe why they worked. Uh, but now I really enjoy them and I really like, and I totally understand why they work now. It's this sort of shared, you know, everyone gets to the same place at the same time and they're all in it together and they're getting a ton of value live. And it's the same thing around trust. You know, whether you hear their voice or you're seeing them on video, you just kind of trust the person more. And I'm up, I'm up there dancing around like a clown to delivering an, <laughs> and delivering value for an hour. Right. And then it's like, Hey, here's, you know, here's lifetime access to this course for this incredibly discounted price. And we just get a ton of users that are like, Oh, I can't believe this is only this price. This is so great. Blah, 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 blah. So, um, it's a lot of fun because we just try and completely over deliver and we get a lot of great comments. People are really, really sweet afterwards. So, um, it's, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, no, that's good. It's a strategy that's worked for a long time. And I would imagine that webinars will continue to work for a long time. Just one final question on the webinars, I guess, are you doing any automated webinars like part of your funnel or, um, anything like that where it's, you know, pre-recorded? Yeah, we're doing both live and automated. We're testing uh, both right now. Mm -hmm. The jury's sort of out on what we'll do. I'm more comfortable doing live webinars, but we are doing doing both. Yeah, no, that's very cool. Good. So, and sort of a, I'm curious, I I don't know this one, but do you build any sites outside of ClickMinded? Do you have any of your own sort of uh, pet, you know, SEO projects on the side? Good question. I do not. Okay. And I was, it's really interesting because, you know, ClickMinded was like my 15th idea, right? Yeah. I, I tried so many different things, went down so many different roads. And I don't think, I was really neurotic about trying a lot of different ideas. But uh, I had a mentor once who sort of, once I was, had started to generate a little bit of traction with ClickMinded, I, I started to veer off in another direction. And I had a mentor, a friend of mine, smacked me over the side of the head and said, idiot, work on this one one thing. Don't, don't do another thing. And so maybe one day in the future I would branch out again, but for the, for the short term and medium term, I doubt it. We love this business. We love our our users and we have a lot more to do. So I'm very focused on it now. Yeah. I think that makes sense. If you have something that's working and it's going in the right direction, 
it probably makes sense not to divert your focus too much from that. So For sure. another question, just you're talking about SEO a lot. You're thinking about SEO a lot. Your users are asking you a lot of questions. So do you have any sort of SEO predictions when you look at SEO five or 10 years down the road from now? What do you think Google and the SEO landscape is going to look like? Is it going to change that much? Ooh, interesting. You know, I am very, I think predictions, I don't want to be in the business of predictions, but I am very, <laughs> but I'm very curious about voice. Um, I love voice. Yeah. I know some big name people are betting on voice. I just know personally, the way I like to think about a lot of this stuff is just how it affects my own life. And like I, my life is measurably better by talking to my phone for queries and Google Home. I use Google Home at home and I, I really like it. And, but that's, it's going to be a massive ranking problem. You know, the, the restaurants near me question, like who is going to get into that three pack, right? Yeah. Or that, that, that seven pack. Um, and is it going to be paid? How are they going to show paid? Um, it's more that I like, I don't want to say I'm, I know what's going to happen is it's, it's interesting to think about the direction it's going to go in and then think about the problems from Google's perspective and how to reverse engineer them. Right. So are people really going to just talk into Alexa and Google and say, you know, restaurant near me, coffee shop near me, uh, department store near me. And then how will those get populated? If that's the case and we actually aren't having a visual representation of documents and it's just audio, there's, I think there's going to be the power law distribution of rankings, right? 75% of clicks go to the top five results. I don't think it's too crazy to think it might be only be one or two or three, yeah. um, which is terrifying. That's even, you know, the victor, the, the, the spoils go even more to the victor. It's an even more rich get richer type situation. So I think that could be incredibly promising and incredibly terrifying as well. Yeah. It is. It's interesting to think about because there are a lot of specific search queries like that, especially probably local search queries, kind of like uh, what you're talking about. But there's also, um, you know, other search queries that voice doesn't work very well for, right? You know, spe specifically things you want to look at pictures of, right? Like what's the 25 cool ideas to do this with my house, right? Or whatever. Great um, point. So, um, I think you're right that voice is going to probably change a lot, but there's a huge segment of search queries uh, that we're doing SEO for that I don't know how it's going to change, you know, so I'll, I'll be curious to live through it myself. Yeah. And I think that's, that's a really good point. Like, you know, every mobile, mobile get in and mobile SEO and everyone's, you know, so, uh, there's been so much focus on mobile and rightfully so with AMP and all these other things, but mm -hmm. you're, you're really, it's a really good point around, um, understanding the impact on a vertical to vertical basis. Right. So for example, in, in training with any kind of, you know, we're doing a lot of enterprise training now and all of our digital marketing training, the vast majority of queries are still on desktop people aren't using their mobile phone to sign up for a, a six hour course. Right. Mm, yeah. And so that's a really good point. How do I decorate my house, getting inspiration for whatever there, there's definitely going to be certain query sets that are completely insulated from a change in the medium, right? Like people won't be doing voice search for house inspiration that I agree right. with you completely. So that's probably worth keeping in mind for yeah. sure. Yeah. And no, just interesting to think about where it's going to go in the future, but uh, we'll, we'll be along for the ride. So do you have any sort of final either SEO or just general business tips uh, that you'd like to share with my audience before you go? Yeah, I think the big whenever like friends ask me and they're they have a side project and they get really, really antsy about it. They ask when they should quit their job or when they should jump jump out or when they're going to start seeing success. Um, again, again, I think this is something that Dan, Dan Andrews coined, Dan and Ian uh, from Tropical MBA, but mm -hmm. it's the idea called the thousand day principle. The basic idea is that you need, when you have a side project, you need about a thousand days to get your business generating as much revenue as your full-time salary. And when I heard that first, I was like, no, <laughs> there's, there's no way it takes that long. Like it, that's about three years. Right. Mm -hmm. And then I did out the math after it happened and it was crazy how accurate that was for me. Like my, my breaking, even breaking my salary level was like 1040 days or something like that. Wow. It was crazy. 
And I, I, I just keep meeting people over and over who have succeeded and done it and quit their job. And it's always around that time. Maybe it's a little longer, maybe it's a little slower, but if you have an audience and they're, um, they're working a full-time job and they're trying to escape and they're working on a side project, I have really bad news. And the, <laughs> the news, the news is you probably need to buckle in. It's probably going to take about a thousand days. Yeah, I think that's uh, a great reminder or great uh, advice because I've, I've seen things similarly. Uh, and what is also interesting to think on the flip side is how quickly a thousand days can go by um, mm. if you're not taking action. You know, I, I get a lot of people that I know have read my blog for five or six or seven years. And then they look back and go, man, if I would have really buckled down three years ago, I could be out of my job right now. Right. Mm -hmm. And it, and it right. goes by like that. So I, I guess uh, my sort of two cents as well to add on top of that is just for people to take action. Yes, it probably will take a thousand days. It's going to take a while to get things started. But if you don't start now, you're going to be wishing you had started, you know, a long time ago. So And was, was that about your timeline, Spencer? I mean, when you were quitting your job, was it about a you thousand know, days? That is interesting. I'd never thought about that. I started... Boy, if I were to look back at when I really got serious about building websites on the site, I think it was somewhere around early 2009, I want to say. Mm -hmm. um, I had built websites before, but kind of got serious about it. And then I quit my job March of 2011. So to, probably two, two and a half Two and a half. There yeah, it is. Something like that. So not too far off, I would say. Yeah. Sounds um, right. Yeah. Sounds right. So very good. I appreciate you, Tommy, coming on to the Niche Pursuits podcast. If people want to stay in touch with you or reach out to you, is there any place they can go to do that? Yeah, uh, we're at clickminded.com. On Twitter, I'm at Tommy Griffith. And we have these uh, these super dorky, this is the best part about when you quit your job and you go full time on a side project is you can do dumb things that might not have any return on investment. But we created these super dorky uh, digital marketing and SEO strategy guides. They're modeled after old school Nintendo Power strategy guides from the 90s. I love it. Like, um, like these retro. So if you played Super Nintendo or Nintendo in the 90s and you ever had these Nintendo Powers, uh, that, that's sort of how they're designed. So uh, if it's cool with you, Spencer, I'll give you the link to those and, uh, and people can grab them if they want. Yeah, please do. I'll, I'll include that in the show notes and um, people can grab those, but, and they can also uh, reach out to you if they want to uh, stay in touch. Overall, Tommy, I really appreciate you coming on, sharing your story, how you built your business and just all the experiences you've had along the way. Yeah, Spencer, this was great. It was great to finally meet you after having used your, your tool for so yeah, long. I, I really great. appreciate it. <laughs> Thank Thanks you so much. Yep. Appreciate it. Thank you once again for listening to the Niche Pursuits podcast. As a reminder, this episode has been sponsored by Ezoic. Ezoic is a Google award winning technology that everyone from niche website owners to major brands use to grow and monetize their websites. Ezoic is a Google certified publishing partner. It's a platform that leverages artificial intelligence to help you optimize revenue and monetization on a per visitor basis and so much more. If you want to check out Ezoic, go to nichepursuits.com slash Ezoic. Again, that's nichepursuits.com slash Ezoic. Thanks a lot.